How's it going, everybody? Let me know if you can hear me fine. I don't think my mic is in action. Let me just. I'm late. Correct. How about now? Is that better? Okay, good. So tonight we're going to talk about the topic of evolution, um, the Catholic faith, and then what St. Thomas would say about it. So as a bit of context, um, it's become popular in Catholic sources to be very favorable towards the question of evolution when it comes to the doctrine of how the human nature, uh, the, the flesh of man arose, and that the soul was immediately infused into this pre-existent human nature created by evolution, human uh, flesh created by evolution. God used um, evolved material in order to form man. So this is based on um, what I believe is a faulty understanding of the relationship between faith and reason. And this has especially, unfortunately, become really common in uh, neo-Thomistic circles, arguing from the relationship of faith and reason, and then also using some um, new uh, methods of biblical interpretation, which they claim to draw from later 20th century um, statements like in De Verbum and then in the Pontifical Biblical Institutes a study on the topic where there's this revival of um, the synthesis of critical biblical interpretation into Catholic biblical interpretation in the literal sense of scripture. So you'll get from the for example, the American Catholic Catechism in the US CCB, they'll call this interpretation that I'm gonna put forward, which is the non-evolutionist interpretation. They call it fundamentalist. That's a very uh, popular buzzword, but I just call it the traditional interpretation of the church Catholic. Okay, so I think really the key behind understanding this question from a Thomistic point of view is going to be in Thomas's De Eternitate Mundi on the eternity of the world. So as many of you probably know, Aristotle and uh, Plato, I also I, I believe, and many other ancient philosophers inter interpreted uh, the creation of the world as being eternal. That it wasn't created in time, but in order to safeguard the immutability of God, they posited that God created from eternity the world. Not that it's the same eternity that is God's, which is without succession, but the earth is just without beginning and without end. So the illustration that they're going to use for this is if you imagine a foot in sand, in eternity, and then ask the question about um, whether the footprint existed in eternity. You would say, yes, of course, the footprint existed in eternity. And then also ask the question of whether the foot caused the footprint. You would also say, yes. So there is something which is eternal, which can also be caused. So there wouldn't be any sort of temporal uh, priority but it really is a logical priority with the relationship between God and creation. Okay, so St. Thomas, in dealing with this question in De Eternitate Mundi, he basically said that the philosophers hadn't committed any crimes against reason, that it was perfectly reasonable according to, uh, according to our reason to affirm that the earth was eternal. 
There's nothing contradictory to philosophy in affirming this. But he would also say in this that since the creation of the world is an object of faith, then faith trumps um, these, there's two valid options, and faith trumps the other valid option. So he says, let us assume in accordance with the Catholic faith that the world had a beginning in time. So there's these two valid options, the eternality of the world, which isn't contradictory to reason. And there's also the, the fact that the world had a beginning in time, which is also not contradictory to reason. So philosophers based on natural revelation could put forth either one of these options and not be uh, put, putting forth a crime against reason. But we know that the earth has a beginning, not from natural revelation, but we know it through faith. And therefore, one of these valid options is denied because we know by faith that the earth has a beginning. So it, there's, there's this sort of battle that goes on among conflicting interpretations of natural revelation and whichever has the side of faith is the one that wins the argument and wins the battle. So I think that this principle can be rightly implied to the question of evolution. Because in natural revelation, we have two uh, principles, I mean, two uh, frameworks, which both do not contradict reason. We have the evolutionary framework. And I'm not going to go into the scientific uh, arguments over whether it does or does not contradict reason. I honestly don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm going to focus on the theological and philosophical implications. And then you have the second option, which is the traditional option, the, the Catholic option, which is um, the fact that the earth, I mean, not the fact that the earth, the fact that man was immediately created body and soul from God that the body didn't come from some creation of pre-existent material. Rather, the body of man was created immediately from the dust of the earth. So now we have to ask the question, because what I've, what I've said before sort of begs this question of whether or not it is an object of faith that the body of man came immediately from God. Is that an object of faith? And I would say explicitly that St. Thomas would answer to the affirmative. For example, he writes in Prima Pars, quote, I answer that the first formation of the human body could not be by the instrumentality of any created power, which would include evolution, but was immediately from God not immediately, immediately. Therefore, as no pre-existing body has been formed whereby another body of the same species could be generated, this ironically seems directly to be the evolutionist point of view, the first human body was of necessity created immediately by God. And now further, when we think about what an object of faith is, an object of faith is going to be either about God or about the works of God. So when it comes to the works of God, the creation of the body of man is clearly a divine work. So therefore, whatever faith says about this divine work must be authoritative. So now let's let's think a little bit about the interpretation of scripture in this. So what the, the Neotomists will say is that when you look at the spiritual sense of Genesis 1 to 3, you get these other theological uh, implications. And that Genesis 1 to 3 primarily is referred to um, these spiritual um, implications that come from it. But we must also... View look at St. Thomas's view of the literal sense of scripture. Because according to St. Thomas, doctrine can only be established on the basis of the literal sense. So we look at his 
commentary on the sentences, his prologue, he says, quote, to the confutation of errors, one proceeds only through the literal sense because other senses are accepted by similitudes and arguments cannot be derived from similitudes of expressions. So the response that you're going to get from these neotomists and these other um, evolutionists among Catholics is going to be that there's an assumption being made that the literal sense is an immediate creation of the body of man. They would say that the literal sense, if we're going to go in accordance to the literary form as affirmed in De Verbum and then in the Pontifical Biblical Institution, Institute's um, words on the matter, then the literary form is very important. And they would say that this is not a historical document, Genesis 1 through 11. So they're going to quote De Verbum, which says, quote, to search out the intention of the sacred writers, attention should be given, among other things, to, quote, literary forms, end quote. For truth is set forth and expressed differently in texts which are variously historical, prophetic, poetic, or of other forms of discourse. The interpreter must investigate what meaning the sacred writer intended to express and actually expressed in particular circumstances by using contemporary literary forms in accordance with the situation of his own time and culture. For the correct understanding of what the sacred authors wanted to assert, due attention must be paid to the customary and characteristic styles of feeling, speaking and narrating, which prevailed at the time of the sacred writing, and to the patterns men normally employed at that period in their everyday dealings with one another. And they would say that this text is a certain literary form, not meant to convey history, Therefore, the literal sense of this passage is not about the immediate creation of the body. So now if we look at at least the, um, the consensus of Catholic interpreters in the history of the church, this goes complete, to make this deduction goes completely against how they would have interpreted the literal sense of Genesis 1 through 11. And also, if you look at the magisterial documents, when it comes to what the literal sense of Genesis 1 through 11 is, then you see that it is certainly conveying history. So Pope St. Pius XII, actually, I think it's just Pope Pius XII, regards the literary form of this passage to be historical, as he writes in his encyclical Humanae Generis. Quote, just as in the biological and anthropo anthropological science, so also in the historical sciences, there are those who boldly transgress the limits and safeguards established by the church. In a particular way, must be deplored a certain too free interpretation of the historical books of the Old Testament. So he's dealing with this right now. The first 11 chapters of Genesis do nevertheless pertain to history in a true sense. If, however, the ancient sacred writers have taken anything from popular narrations, and this may be conceded, it must never be forgotten that they did so with the help of divine inspiration, through which they were rendered immune from any error in selecting and evaluating those documents. Therefore, whatever of the popular narr narrations have been inserted into sacred scripture must in no way be considered on a par with myths or other such things, which are more the product of extravagant imagination than of that striving for truth and simplicity, which is in the sacred books, also of the Old Testament, is so apparent that our ancient sacred writers must be admitted to be clearly superior to the ancient profane writers in history. So if we're going to take that statement from Pope Pius XII, we're going to recognize that Genesis 1 through 11 in the statements of the works of God is giving us a historical narrative. Now, I'll admit that in the spiritual sense, especially in the allegorical sense, writers throughout history, especially if you look at Origen, if you look at St. Augustine, if you look at even the writings of St. Thomas Aquinas, there has been much gathered aside from as an application of the literal sense into other matters. 
but we cannot throw away the fact that Genesis 1 through 3 is describing the literal procession of the literal creation of the, the flesh and soul of man immediately from God. That is what must be affirmed in, in a Catholic biblical interpretation. And then in a Catholic sense of the relationship between faith and reason, we must deny evolution. So this brings us into a philosophical question about what we can know by science. I think this is honestly the most important part of what I'm going to say is about the philosophy of science. So science reasons from certain effects to causes. As Aristotle teaches, it is from sense experience to the causes of things. That's what science is. It's trying to look at the order and cause, causes of things. Now, it is my contention that the object under consideration, that is the creation of the flesh of man, cannot ordinarily proceed this way. For there are two options. First, the human body was created immediately by God. The Catholic option and the option which falls under the literal sense of scripture. Second, the human body arose out of certain evolutionary processes guided by God, which is the position of the theistic evolutionist. So science would not be able to reason from cause to effect in this matter because it could not sense a supernatural intervention, but seeks out natural explanations. So if we're going to presuppose that the creation of man immediately by God is a supernatural event, why would we expect scientists contemplating natural revelation to be able to sense this miracle and provide that as an explanation? Of course, they're going to seek natural explanations like evolutionary theory. For example, if science had the certain data that there was a sick man who was sick and became well, having tests from before, during, and after the sickness, the scientists would determine from this that the man was healed according to the natural mode in which a body recovers. That's what the scientific method would propose. Let's imagine now that this man was miraculously healed directly by God. The scientist investigating the man would not be able to discern, uh, discern that this was the mode of healing. The data from the man would look identical whether he was healed after the natural mode or after a miraculous mode. It is the same with the process of creation. The data from an evolutionarily derived body and an immediately derived body looks the same. It is only by the eyes of faith that we can tell the difference. Therefore, there is no reason to prefer the former over the latter. Okay, that's all I really have to say on, on this matter. I think the philosophy of science and understanding a true relationship between faith and reason is really important here because science really would not be able to tell which option is true. One derived from the scriptural account or one derived from the natural reasoning from effects to cause. The data would look the exact same in both of them. So I don't know why we would concede the traditional doctrine of the church when it comes to the creation of the body of man and then take upon the, the scientific um, consensus of evolution. So are there any questions? I'm going to look in the chat. So Warren D says, for later reference, Peter Kreeft says in his lectures on Aquinas that Aquinas would support Darwinian evolution because of his view of providence, natural and secondary causes in Thomas's thought. You know, that is really wrong. Um, I'm going to pull up a quote really quick from St. Thomas. St. Thomas um, actually would have considered an option where um, under providence and under natural and secondary causes, he considered this option through the instrumentality of the angels and through the instrumentality of the heavenly bodies. Because there were theories at this time of this mode of creation that a God that God kind of set the ball of creation rolling 
and then use these uh, means and instruments to create man. But he explicitly denies that this is the case, very explicitly. And he reasons that this cannot be the case because, again, creation is a divine event, not something which can be through the instruments of second causes. So it's really interesting that he would say that Peter Kreeft is a much clearer thinker than that, because Thomas really directly deals with this sort of idea in a, in a more primitive and ancient form and not exactly in the context we're speaking, but nevertheless, it still does apply. Kreeft said that Thomas would have changed his views on the creation of the world being a matter of faith. <laughs> If he had around, if he had been around when scientists proved the Big Bang. I don't even know what to say to that. That is, um, that's kind of silly to say that he would have changed his view of the creation of the world being an object of faith. Do you think our angelic doctor is, is of so little, um, so little faith that he would abandon uh, that he would abandon um, that the creation of the world is an object of faith. Come on, the the dude loved the the dude, the the saint loved Aristotle, and he could have accepted the view of the eternality of the world. That was that was the view to take um, for Aristotelians and Platonists. But he didn't. He denied it because he recognized that the creation of the world was an object of faith. And I don't really get why the, the Big Bang is, is necessarily against the idea that, um, that the creation of the world is a matter of faith. Big Bang is kind of just, um, it, I, I don't, I, again, I don't get why that would go against that because that would just be the the mode in which God was creating everything out of nothing would be from a, from a single point. So I don't, again, I don't get that. It doesn't seem too clear. So he discusses evolution in his lectures frequently. Yeah. Again, um, among neotomists, I mean, you'll get it from, my beloved Thomistic Institute. I love those guys and I listen to almost everything they produce, but they are very strict um, evolutionists because of the way in which they've used St. Thomas's um, view of the relationship between faith and reason. So Corey, he said, Big Bang is literally what could have happened when God spoke and created the universe ex nihilo. OMG, you said it at the same time as me, twinsies. Yeah, that that's that's just the mode in which things happen ex nihilo. I, I don't get what's going on there. Why he would um, why he would say such a crazy thing as Saint Thomas would, in light of a perfectly reasonable and perfectly synthesized with the Christian faith scientific view, that he would just say that the creation of the world is an object of reason and not an object of revelation. That's just crazy. Lettere even denied that the Bing Bang was about creation. He thought of it as an icon of creation, but not creation itself. I think that's a good way of thinking about it. It's an icon of, of creation. Is that's really just the vestiges that we're able to see of the mode of God's work that we already know exists, but it's just providing us with a certain natural insight that we, that scripture does not explicitly or implicitly cover. No creeft doesn't. Stupid dogs. I hate dogs. They're the worst. I have a confession, guys. Dogs are the worst, and I hate them. I don't like puppies. I don't like cats. I just don't like animals. I don't like animals. I like children, like an adult. I'm sorry, guys, but children are better. So 
no grief doesn't say that the Big Bang disproves anything in Scripture. So, but he calls out what he sees as errors in Thomas because scientists have supposedly proved a 15 billion year old Earth, etc. I mean, I, I think definitely, I, I will concede this. I think the age of the Earth is a complete. I know Corey's going to disagree with me on this, but the age of the Earth is a completely different question. A completely different question. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Then is the fact of evolution or the theory of evolution. So, so when it comes to the age of the earth, I, I don't think from the scriptural account that you can gather a definite um, age. I mean, traditionally, it would be 6,000 years old. But I don't think it's an object of faith because it's not explicitly spoken of in scripture. So, I mean, there's plenty of um, corollaries where you could where you could add, quote unquote, to the um, to the age which on the surface appears in scripture. I've been black pilled on dogs recently, especially breeds like pit bulls. I'm gonna agree with you. I mean, just think about the modern uh, use of dogs. So if we're gonna speak about the good, the good is the um, proper and ideal use according to nature. Having dogs as, as house pets that just sit around and do nothing all day, except be annoying and attack children. That's just not according to the proper use of a dog. A dog should be hurting animals or hunting or uh, protecting or, or stuff like that. Not just sitting around like the modern American house pet would. It's just a complete abuse of the nature of dog. And that I'm very anti um, the modern iterations of, of dogs. It's kind of like, um, if you think about modern factory farming, that's something that I've been kind of thinking about recently. So when it comes to modern factory farming, um, factory farming is a complete abuse of the nature and goodness of, of an animal. It is, it is not in accordance with the nature of, of animalness. It's like a cow. A cow isn't created in its idealized form in the, in the mind of God isn't that it just be huddled in these uh, four foot by six foot little troughs and just milked until they get so fat that they die like, or other iterations like chickens are the worst. I lived in Maryland and on the eastern shore of Maryland, there's a lot of chicken farms. And these things were just packed in one on top of the other. That is not in accordance with the, the nature of a chicken. And that's, it's not something that's good because it's not in accordance with the, the, the form, which is inhering in the mind of God eternally. Okay. Breeds like pit bulls are naturally violent. Yeah. That is really sad. Um, I'd never get one. There's actually a pit bull like roaming around the, the neighborhood that I live in and attacked um, like attacks the dogs, other dogs. It's kind of weird. Maybe somebody should shoot it. Okay. Any other questions? It can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about the relationship between reason and faith or evolution. Yeah, but I think, um, what kind of put me off of the anti-evolutionist view is like people like Ken Ham being so dogmatic about it. I'll get back to you with those lectures on Kreef and I'll send you quotes. Good. I'll actually, I'll listen to those lectures. When it comes to uh, guys like Ken Ham and, and Kent Hovind and, and all those guys from my fundamentalist upbringing, they're just way too dogmatic about it. Because if you think, as long as you affirm a historical atom, 
then you really should have no problem. The magisterium has, has really left this question open to the decisions of, of theologians and of scientists. So it's not anything to, to, um, to get all up in arms about. I loved Kent Hovind, he literally helped me convert. You mean like, you mean Dr. Dino? <laughs> yeah, he's got some wacky, wacky views. Very wacky views, like he thinks um, that like dinosaurs and humans were just chilling. But isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm completely open to the fact that humanity was was created directly from God. 6,000 years ago, and then before that, there was um, there was a bunch of animals who existed, possibly dinosaurs and, um, and other things. I have no problem with that. But I think it's really weird that you're going to say that humans and dinosaurs were existing at the same time. I do think that's really weird. Generally okay with God as long as you have a historical atom. Yeah, I think... Because when you look at necessary articles of the faith, in order for an article to not to, to be necessary, it has to in some way uh, contradict fundamental articles of the faith. So historical Adam is a fundamental article of the faith. I mean, read through uh, Paul's epistles, especially um, 1 Corinthians 15 and then, um, and then Romans 5. You get the importance of the uh, of the historical Adam right there. That and it has been explicitly contradicted by the magisterium that there was multiple groups of people that existed. So I don't really get what honestly I don't really get what the the evolutionists were were trying to get at because it's like what do you think that human nature evolved? It, um, I mean, the human flesh, the human body evolved, and then God infused a soul into it. And then there's just one of them. Well, I guess just two of them, Adam and Eve. How do you think they had children back then? You think everybody just had two children and they married? Is that what you think happened? Because it's because either one, where the heck did these other non-souled human body creatures go? Did God just nuke them all? And... Or second, you're going to affirm that it was just a bunch of people that were ensouled. Well, then that goes against any reasonable explanation of the Christian faith and is condemned by the magisterium. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Honestly, I don't get what the way out is for, um, for, for the evolutionists in this question. How would evolution affect Mariology? Example, would the evolved Adam and Eve be immaculately conceived from other, some other species rather than created from the dust? Yeah, so um, with the theistic evolutionists, what they're going to say is that you have this, so you have like the normal evolutionist um, propaganda, I'm joking, not propaganda, <laughs> um, account you're going to have from the uh, I, I don't know, the emergence of a single cell organism hand, handled by the providence of God. And then it evolves eventually into uh, the human body, but without a soul. So if it doesn't have a, a human soul, then it's it can't sin. And then directly is infused into two of these people. Well, not people yet, but directly infused into two of these it's, these primordial humans but without souls are human souls and then these are adam and eve but uh, again what what the heck happened to all the other uninsouled people so really you wouldn't have a problem with sin in this in this framework because the unsold humans wouldn't have any souls therefore they wouldn't be sinning because they don't have really a human intellect appetites or will so they couldn't sin so max colby said that the message of lords rules out adam and eve being conceived like the rest of us what could you could you explain that more 
Adam and Eve being conceived like the rest of us? Or you mean, do you mean created like the rest of us? And what would that part of the message of Lords be? Be very interested. Even though I'm not, actually that is a very um, small part of, of, my, of my knowledge is, um, is marrying apparitions. That's just, hasn't really been um, a point of too much interest to me. So it seems a little more apocalyptic. And then it, again, you're not bound by um, public, private revelations. You're not bound by faith, by private revelations. So I'm not really concerned. I mean, they're obviously important to the piety of the church. So I know generally about them, but I'm not obsessive. Like a lot of um, people can be very obsessive. So likewise, on the other side, pro-evolution Christians usually treat others like dirt and naming them with derogatory terms like fundamentalists. Yeah, it's, um, it is kind of a really weird um, relationship between the pro and the anti-evolutionists. With the, uh, the pro-evolutionists against the anti-evolutionists, they're basically dummy fundamentalists who need to get with the time. And then with the anti-evolutionists, the pro-evolutionists, they're just liberal modernist heretics and um and i think at least from people around my age and then around our generation of, of people interested in theology there's a lot more um reason to this to this debate that we're not a bunch of backcountry fundamentalist idiots and that the other side of this debate aren't a bunch of modernist liberal heretics we're just both trying to be faithful to God's revelation, either in nature or in scripture. Because Mary said, I am the immaculate conception. I don't get what, how that would have to do with, uh, with Adam and Eve, sorry. Okay, so Andrew Gilchrist said something that somewhat puts me off about the strict literalist interpretation, though it probably is the most correct, is that the implication that we all bumped our cousins until a certain point. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> but I mean, if you look at Abraham and Sarah, how was... Abraham related to Sarah. Anyone want to answer? You got it. Half sister. Which that in itself is is awkward, and you get a lot of these instances. You also um, you also get a lot of examples of of cousins, second and third cousins, and, and stuff like that, would, that wouldn't be acceptable in our modern context. But it is um, possible that that was the practice of the time, and that wasn't seen as being weird until our current point, obviously, when we have laws of um, laws in this, in this matter, which I think are good. I think they're very good. I think it definitely is not prudent to allow that to happen. Okay. So Warren said, I think his point is given macroevolution, they were immaculately conceived because they had no sin before the fall. But how would that have to do with Adam and Eve? I'm still not getting that because Mary said that I am the Immaculate Conception. Oh, oh, I get what you're saying now. Because Mary is the Immaculate Conception, nobody else could be immaculately conceived besides her. I get it. I get it now. Okay, any other questions? I really hope, I mean, I think the biggest hurdle that the evolutionists have to 
have to go over is really the um, the question of how we are to interpret the literal sense of of Genesis one to three. What is the literal sense? And what has been affirmed as a literal sense in Catholic tradition, and then also some magisterial documents. Is evolution cringe? Yes. What was the monkey comment? I'm looking for it. The dinosaur adventure land. I'm sorry, Corey, but I honestly I want to go one day one time to there because I think that would be interesting. I don't get the, I, I didn't see the monkey comment. I'm on live chat too, not top chat. Okay, so I saw a video where Father Rippinger, Rip, Rip Perger said the evidence is pretty scarce. You know, I actually trust him because, because he has his like doctorate in psychology, doesn't he? One of one of the um, one of the sciences. So I mean, he knows the the method of I, honestly. When it comes to academia, um, there's a certain habit of research and then evaluation of evidence that is built up in some programs. So like when you have somebody who like him has a PhD in that, I don't think his PhD is in psychology. I wonder what it is in. I thought he had something to do with psychology, but either way, when you have certain uh, research experience like that, even in adjacent field, I'm gonna trust him in that. I said the key reason we should reject evolution is that our Lord and the Blessed Virgin Mary are descended from monkeys. No thanks. Yeah, that'd be pretty cringe if we were to say that our Blessed Lady and our Lord are descended from monkeys. Yeah, I don't, because like again, like again, I know I've belabored this point, but what exactly is the point of the evolutionist's view? Like you have all these non-ensouled humans, and then all of a sudden two of them are just given souls. Like what is what happens to all the other ones? Because obviously they still have to look like us, and they still have, to have the general uh, human nature minus a soul as we do. Like where the heck do they go? Are they Neanderthals or something? Like what what is the answer that they get? Do any of you know? Because I have no idea what, like, where they would go from there. It doesn't make any sense. So this is PhD in philosophy, yeah. Like, that's why um, I kind of feel comfortable. Well, they have souls, but not rational souls. Yeah, that's what I meant. They ha they would have um, animal souls, yeah. Souls in the way that the plants and animals do. Yes, because animals do have souls, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> that's... At some point, God decided to put souls into monkeys or something. Yeah. Like, now that I think about it, like, more and more, it just, it, it, it should be evident to any reasonable man that this didn't happen. Like, what, what they're trying to do, granted, I'm going to make sure I have a heaping of charity on this, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to take a very popular um, view in the uh, biological sciences. And they're trying to synthesize that with the fact that we have to have a historical atom. And you can't. Like, you, you, you cannot synthesize a historical atom with evolutionary beliefs. I mean, it's great that you affirm a historical atom. But it doesn't make sense on the premises that you've put forward about the, about the creation of the historical Adam's body. Like maybe like all of the, the uninsold human monkeys 
all of their uh, all of them died off except two or something like that. I don't know. Do you know anything about old Earth theory? Yeah, I, I kind of did talk about it a little bit earlier, but I can talk about it more. So what you get in the account of Genesis 1 through 11. So this is like you'll get with uh, Archbishop Usher. He has his famous history of the world that dated the creation in like October of, I think it's like October of 4000 BC, somewhere around there. And what he did is he looked through the genealogies found in Genesis 1 through 11 and reasoned back from the other events in the Bible to look at when the creation of the world would have been. But the issue with such a such an approach is, one, you don't know about from the creation of the world. So you look at the seven days. It's not exactly clear that these seven days are 24-hour periods. And honestly, it couldn't be because the first four days didn't have a sun. So what, what are you going to do with that? Because days are measured by the rotation of the sun around the earth. And yes, I said that on purpose. So what we, and then also you don't know about these genealogies, whether there's gaps between them, whether they're children or whether they're, uh, whether they're other more distant descendants, whether the Genesis one through 11 is just giving it best hits or maybe it's giving a direct father to child um, progression. It's not clear which one it is. So honestly, you you can't really get a um, a distinct age of the Earth, and it's really up to a multitude of interpretations. Anything from the vanilla six thousand years old to um, even further than that. So this is why I think macro evolution lends itself to scientific racism. Do you anything about the old Earth theory? Yeah, I'm gonna um, add some other questions. I mean, I'm gonna just, I think that because it would seem that some people who hold that theory hold evolution. Yes, but I think they're completely distinct um, issues because the direct procession of, of the body of man from the hand of God immediately was an object, is an object of faith, whereas the specific age of the earth, not an object of faith. So I think they're completely different questions. And also, when, um, I mentioned, I uh, briefly mentioned it, but uh, I'd be interested in um, getting somebody on to talk about heliocentrism with me. So I think that also gets into questions of the philosophy of science. So I think most of these um, reactions to modernity are going to be more about the philosophy of science than they are about specific scientific data, which you're, which you're then applying the scientific method to. Any other questions? Can Catholics believe in gap creationism? So there's uh, gaps between the days. I'm just trying to clarify. That's what you mean. Because honestly, be honest, guys, my preferred uh, view of the days is. My preferred view of the days is going to be Augustine's view, that it's an instantaneous creation, that the days are just representative of certain logical um, logical points in this creation. That's my favorite, so I guess it lends itself more to a young earth belief for me. What are some pieces of evidence that evolutionists give? Besides animals look alike, so they must have evolved from each other. Yeah, I think it has to do with, um, yeah, basically there's, Basically, there are certain characteristics which are shared by groups of animals. Therefore, they must have descended from a common ancestor. 
it's more complicated than that, but that's going to be the baseline. I mean, I actually, when I was in, um, I think I might've been in uh, freshman year of high school, I read Darwin's On the Origin of Species. That's basically, if I remember correctly, that's the argument he gave is that we see these, um, these certain patterns. So this would be the most reasonable. And obviously it has to do with certain philosophical currents of this time. He was basically applying um, Enlightenment era philosophy to um, biology and the question of the origin of the origin of species. Days are literal, but the two creation narratives happen at different times. It's possible. It's possible. But it would have a problem then. Uh, there would be a problem with the sixth day. And with, at least with my view, there'd be a problem with the sixth day being the creation of man, yet it's all instantaneous. Because then there's no there's no gap from the creation of the world to to man. But I mean that's that's a problem with me either way. But I mean, I guess an evolutionist could argue now nah, they couldn't argue. Never mind. They can't argue on the basis of that. They can't really argue on the basis of the different narratives because they would have to say that the sixth day was some um, weird human that doesn't have a soul thing. I encountered a dude that held to geocentrism because he realized how often scientists lie in order to attack Christianity and he felt the church made the right judgment all back then. You know what? I think that might be Corey. Is Corey still here? <laughs> Corey, um, funny aside, we, uh, we went to college together for a semester and we were talking about this issue and he basically said like, yeah, all I know is that whatever people desperately want you to believe in the world among secularists, secularists, I just believe the opposite of what they say. Then I must be right. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I missed anything. You have any more questions? If not, I'm going to log out. And create a poll. Wait a second. Was Georg? No, Bruno. A Thomas. I don't know who that is. I don't know who Bruno is. But an interesting consider uh, geocentric view of the science. Church of scientific innovation is more. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so you'll get. Guys like, uh, what, what, what's his name? The Robert Syngentis. Robert Syngentis. I mean, he has obviously his own problems with a set of a contism. But he argues from the church's magisterial documents that, that it's the Catholic belief to hold the geocentrism. And it seems to be the plainer um, account of scripture, but again, that could be a literary form. That that is a proper uh, application of the idea of literary form because, like for example, we talk about the sun rising. We don't talk about the sun like over the horizon, just shooting up and then going around us and shooting down. That's not what we're talking about. When we talk about the sun rising. It's just an idiomatic expression. So ancient Hebrews could use a similar idiomatic expression when it comes to the, the spatial relationship between the sun and the earth. But honestly, I think scientifically, at least. It's a moot point to argue about this because if motion in relative to a point in space, um, it just depends on the perspective of that point in space, what is moving around what. So you could really say anything is the center of the universe and it doesn't move. You could say you are the center of the universe if you really want to. And that everything by the perspective of you moves around. That'd be an interesting theory. 
Geocentrists would argue that the scientific innovations give further credit to geocentrism. I looked up Bruno, Dominican friar in the late 1500s, tried for de denying the Trinity, divinity of Jesus, and real presence. Yeah, um, denying the Trinity, divinity of Christ, and real presence. I don't think he was too good of a too good of a Thomist. <laughs> Safe to say that he wasn't a Thomist. Hence why St. Genis calls Einstein a closet geocentrist. Yeah, because I mean, if I've I've talked to actually people that are in like math, um, physics type related fields about it, because I had my own my own kick with that sort of thing. And when you explain it with uh, relation to relativity, they're like, well, yeah, I guess theoretically anything could be the center of the universe. Sounds like dinner's ready. So unless you have any burning questions, I'm going to log off. Infinite universe. Yeah, that used to be a cringe scientific belief, infinite universe. And then the church won over because of the Big Bang. Yeah, what idiot is going to say that space is infinite and so dumb? <laughs> like what? <sighs> Obviously, a body can't be extended to infinity. Lutherans. Bruno did. He said that bodies were extended to infinity. I swear, some people, you know, most... Like, Thomism is called a philosophy of common sense. Some people just need common sense. Wikipedia says Bruno was a free thinker and accepted Copernicus's theories. Well, if we know anything from church history, free thinkers burn well. A great kindling. Okay, well, I'm going to log out. Y'all have a great rest of your day. And um, make sure you remember to follow me everywhere, Facebook, Twitter, you know the deal. And then also, if you really love what I'm doing and would like me to keep doing what I do and to do more of what I do, then become a patron and I will forever love you. Okay, goodbye.